Assalamu alaikum friends, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to talk about Strongyloides turcuralis. This is a continuation of the parasitology series, partially the nematodes. If you haven't watched my nematode introduction video, its link is in the description or floating in the top right corner. Don't forget to watch that. Before starting the lecture, I like to tell that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcomed in the comment section. Have a cup of tea and let's get started. Strongyloides has many species, but the one that commonly affects humans is the Strongyloides turcaralis. Its second name is thread worm. It is an intestinal nematode, the human pathogenic parasitic roundworm. It is responsible for causing strongyloidiasis. In the picture, you can see the strongyloidus tercoralis worm. We'll discuss its structure in the morphology section. Lecture outline. I have introduced you guys to the strongyloidus tercoralis. Now we'll talk about its morphology, habitat and transmission, life cycle, pathogenesis and epidemiology, clinical findings, lab diagnosis, treatment, and then the prevention. Before starting the morphology, I like to tell that there are certain stages that exist in the life cycle of the Strongyloides turcaralis. First is egg, second one is larva, and third one is adult worm. Let's start with the morphology of egg first. Its shape is ellipsoid. We will visualize its image a bit later, but now focus on the theory. Its size varies from 40 to 85 micrometers in length. These eggs are dark in color. Every egg contains a larva in the thin wall. As in this picture, you can see this Strongyloides turcoralis egg. Its shape is ellipsoid. This is how an ellipsoid shape looks like. It has a larva inside it and this is its thin wall. Lava. When egg hatches, it releases the rhabditiform larva. Then this rhabditiform larva develops into filariform larva, which is actually responsible for causing the infection. Infective stage is filariform larvae, as I mentioned earlier, but the diagnostic stage is rhabditiform larvae. Normally, eggs are used for diagnosis, but in this case, larvae rather than the eggs are the diagnostic stage. Here in this picture, you can see the eggs in the orange color mentioned and the hatching process in yellow color mentioned. And then the larvae are released. The larvae are mentioned in green color. Adult worm. It is long, slender. It varies in size from 2 to 3 millimeters in length. This is how the adult threadworm, the Strongyloides turcoralis, looks like. Habitat. The definitive hosts are the human beings for the worms. But in the soil, the filariform larvae exist for some time. And we'll discuss about how the soil cycle occur in life cycle. And Strongyloides turcoralis has no intermediate host. Transmission. Transmission occurs by a penetration of filariform larvae through skin, usually the feet. Life cycle. Strongyloides turcoralis has two distinct life cycles. One within the human body, which is termed as human cycle, which is further classified as lung stage and intestinal stage. And the other one is free living in the soil, which is termed as external cycle or soil cycle or free living cycle. Let's dive in. Human cycle. The life cycle in the human body begins with the penetration of the skin, usually of feet, by infectious, which one? The filariform larvae, exactly. And their migration to the lungs. Here the lung stage starts. They enter the alveoli, pass up the bronchia and trachea, and then are swallowed. When they are swallowed, where they will go? Definitely the GI tract. Here the intestinal cycle starts. In the small intestine, the larvae molt in adults that enter the mucosa and produce eggs. The eggs usually hatch within the mucosa, forming rhabditiform larvae that are passed in feces. All right. When they will be passed in feces, external environment cycle will start. But some larvae molt to form filariform larvae, which penetrate the intestinal wall directly without leaving the host and migrate to the lungs. This is called the auto-infection. 
filariform larvae can also exit the anus and reinfect through the perianal skin. In immunocompetent patients, this is an infrequent, clinically unimportant event. All right, all right. Hyperinfection, also termed as massive reinfection, can also occur. However, in immunocompromised patients, for example, those who have acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, or those who are taking high-dose corticosteroids or tumor necrosis factor, the TNF inhibitors, or patients who are severely malnourished, autoinfection can lead to hyperinfection, which I told you also termed as massive reinfection. But this will occur with larvae passing to many organs with severe, sometimes fatal consequences. Okay, I've left one thing there. This is HTLV. Reinfection can also occur in those infected with human T cell lymphotrophic virus, HTLV, because their ability to mount a protective T cell response is diminished. As I told you, when the larva will pass in feces, external environment cycle will start. Let's discuss that. External environment cycle, also termed as soil cycle or free living cycle. If larvae are passed in feces and enter warm, moist soil, they move through successive stages to form adult male and female worms. After mating, the entire life cycle of egg, larva, and adult can occur in the soil. After several free living cycles, filariform larvae are formed. When they contact skin, they penetrate and again initiate the parasitic cycle within humans. Diagrammatic representation of life cycle of Strongyloides turcoralis. It starts here when rhabditiform larvae in the intestine are excreted in stool. Then they are developed into free living adult worms and these adult worms then produce eggs and then they are hatched and they release rhabditiform which is developed into filariform larvae. This filariform larvae penetrate the human skin responsible for causing the infection. The filariform larvae migrate by various pathways to small intestine where they become adults. When they are adults, they live in the small intestine. The parasitic adult female in the small intestine is shown in this figure. And then eggs are deposited in the intestinal mucosa, rhabditiform larvae hatch and migrate to the intestinal lumen. Autoinfection, hyperinfection, these things will occur as we have discussed. And then when the rhabditiform larvae will be released, it will go to complete the free living cycle. And if it is not released, the filariform larvae will lead to autoinfection or hyperinfection, or which is also termed as massive reinfection. Don't forget that the filariform larvae is the infective stage, while the rhabditiform larvae is the diagnostic stage. Pathogenesis. Adult female worms in the wall of small intestine can cause inflammation, resulting in watery diarrhea. Larvae in the lungs can produce a pneumonitis similar to that caused by Ascaris. Autoinfection can result in chronic strongyloidosis characterized by intermittent abdominal pain, fluctuating rashes, and intermittent eosinophilia. In hyperinfection, the penetrating larvae may cause sufficient damage to the intestinal mucosa that sepsis caused by enteric bacteria such as Escherichia coli and bacteroids fragilis can occur. Epidemiology. Strongyloides occurs primarily in tropics, especially in Southeast Asia. Its geographic pattern is similar to that of hookworm because the same type of soil is required. In United States, strongyloides is endemic in southeastern states. Clinical findings. Most patients are asymptomatic, but symptoms can occur based on location, whether the GI tract, respiratory system, or cutaneous systems. In GI, low worm burden mostly does not cause symptoms, but stomach ache, bloating, heartburn, constipation, nausea, loss of appetite, watery diarrhea can occur. In lungs, dry cough, throat irritation because pneumonitis has occurred. In skin, 
varietous ground itch can occur at the site of larval penetration of the skin, as with hookworms. Strongyloides circularis also causes cutaneous lava migraines, but in some places it was mentioned cutaneous lava currents, which is the rapid migration and perianal involvement. Complications include autoinfection, hyperinfection, which is also termed as massive reinfection, and sepsis. Lab diagnosis. We will need sample of feces. Diagnosis depends on finding the larvae. Which one? Okay, yes, sir. Quickly, quickly. That is rhabditiform larvae, right? Rather than eggs in this stool. As with many nematode infections in which larva migrate through the tissue, eosinophilia can be striking. Serologic tests are useful when the larvae are not visualized. As you can see, the rhabditiform larvae and the filariform larvae there. Treatment. Ivermectin is the drug of choice, while albendazole is an alternative drug. Prevention. Prevention involves disposing of sewage properly and wearing shoes. To prevent strongyloidous hyperinfection in patients scheduled to receive immunosuppressive drugs, for example, corticosteroids or DNF, the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, and who have lived in an area of strongyloidous endemicity, serologic tests to determine whether antibodies to strongyloidous are present should be performed. If antibodies are found, the patients should be treated with ivermectin before immunosuppression is undertaken, if possible. Alright guys, let's review everything quickly. The organism is Strongyloides tercoralis, its common name is threadworm, and it is responsible for causing strongyloidiasis. Its mode of transmission is via penetration of skin by the filariform larvae and the autoinfection. The definitive hosts are human beings. The endemic areas are tropics primarily. Its primary location is intestine, but lungs can also be involved. Diagnosis is based on finding the rhabditiform larvae in the stool and treatment of choice is ivermectin category is the intestinal nematode it has no insect vector stage that infects the human is the filariform larvae that enters the skin stages in humans most associated with the disease is larvae disseminate to various tissues and immunocompromised or to infection important stages outside humans are egg that hatches into rhabditiform larvae that develops into filariform larvae and some of the free living cycle in the soil and that's it for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You've learned something. If you really did, don't forget to give this video a big, big thumbs up. Comment down below in the comment section. Subscribe if you can. And also, don't forget to connect with me on all of my socials. I've got my Instagram. I've got my Twitter. And I really upload blogs. So do check them out. Till next time. Assalamu alaikum.